Oh yeah. Um, <coughs> and it's you know it's a bit puzzling because uh, Razorov, Smolensky, Smolensky, and Razorov, Smolensky proved lower bounds for the analogous circuit class a long time ago. Um, <coughs> And, the co you know, why is it so hard to get the corresponding lower bounds in proof complexity? Um, <coughs> and we don't even have conditional lower bounds. So not only do we not have unconditional, but we can't even prove that under some assumption like NP not equal, except for NP not equal co-NP. So we can't even show that like under cryptographic assumptions or pick an assumption that's just a little bit weaker or a little bit incomparable uh, <laughs> to, to the assumption NP doesn't equal co-NP, which obviously all of these proof systems are not polynomially bounded under that assumption, then we don't even know how to prove that. <coughs> and um, we also don't, don't have any direct connection between a proof complexity lower bound for AC02, Frege, and a circuit lower bound. But you'll be hearing more that there are starting to be some connections. <laughs> when I wrote this slide, there weren't any of the whole bit. There's starting to be more. No, no. So what it does is it rules out a large family of algorithms uh, for solving SAT in polynomial time. I'll get to this toward the end of the talk. So it, roughly speaking, if you have an algorithm whose correctness proof is formalizable in extended Frege, then it rules out all those algorithms. So, so it actually rules out pretty much all the algorithms we know of, uh, but, it, but it doesn't prove P not equal NP. It's again, it's because of the, it, it, it matters what the proof is of the, if, if you have an algorithm that, um, <coughs> that if you have a polynomial time algorithm for SAT, that doesn't mean that you can prove that it works in, in extended Frege. It might, <coughs> okay, so this mode, this was, uh, this was our motivation for studying algebraic proofs. We wanted to look at really simple looking, Proof systems were that, that, that directly had mod gates, um, and that were stripped down versions of Frege systems, where we were really just focusing on the on the algebraic aspect um, to see if we could understand, you know, how to prove something. <coughs> no, that's a really good question. So we can't prove, um, you know, in, in circuit complexity, you can show that almost all functions have high circuit. We can't prove anything like that. That almost all unsatisfiable formulas require. No, nothing like that's known for any proof system that I know of. Because <laughs> yeah. we can't really count tautologies, I guess is the is the uh, the dumbest answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we can't count sm short. We we can't count up to uniqueness short. Pr anyways, the obvious thing doesn't work. The numbers aren't. <laughs> complicated thing which you can prove is complicated mm -hmm. so the object is very so there's many many objects and but the problem is here you want a short proof short statement which requires a large proof which is more like an encrypt to me, to me like a crypto reason. yeah maybe <laughs> anyways we can talk about it later I, I see what you're saying i'm still not sure why we can't count them to be honest i don't have a really good understanding of that but there's no crypto no no so lots of good problems to work on. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the simplest of the algebraic systems based on Hilbert's null stone sets. So instead of working with directly with CNFs, we work more generally with slow degree polynomials over some field. In proof complexity, we ten tend to think of the field as being like GF2 or some finite field, but you don't have to. Um, so P is an initial set of polynomial equations, and Hilbert's null stone sets, you probably all know this, just states that... Um, <coughs> that these systems all together are, are unsolvable if and only if there's another set of polynomials Q1 through Qm um, <coughs> that where the sum of the p's times the q's is 1. Or in other words, 1 is in the ideal generated by the p's. Okay? And you have to be over an algebraically closed field. And you view the q's as a proof of unsolvability of the p's, and by Hilbert's null stone says this is sound and complete. Okay? The degree of the proof is the maximum degree of the q's. Okay? 
And so the, the null Stolensitz degree of the initial equations, P, is the minimum degree over all such refutations. So how do we use this for you know, CNF Boolean, the Boolean case? So you start with a CNF formula over variables x1 through xn. Like I said before, I typically think of the field as being finite, but there's interesting results over <laughs> other fields. And then you convert the clauses to uh, po slow degree polynomial equations in the obvious way. Um, <coughs> and you also want to add these equations, xi squared minus xi equals zero, okay? Because we want to force zero one solutions. We really want to be in the Boolean case. Okay, so the p's corresponding to an f are the, y you convert the clauses and that gives you m equations plus n more equations, one for each variable. Okay, and that's the set p. And Q is, is as it was before. It's just a bunch of uh, polynomials Q where the sums of the P's times the Q's is one. Okay. And the complexity measure is just the maximum degree of these Q's. Right, but once you have Xi squared minus X equals zero, it uh, doesn't, uh, you don't have to be in an algebraically closed field anymore. Yeah, I think Pavel will talk more about the more general case. <coughs> okay, a dynamic version of Stolens. So null Stolens, that's you basically, the, the, the proof is like given to you in one shot, okay? And the degree is the maximum over the QIs. Another version is called the polynomial calculus. It's the same system, but you're viewing deg the degree measure in a more dynamic fashion, okay? So you think of it more as a rule-based system where you start with the P's, you start by asserting that they're all zero, and then you're allowed to <coughs> take two previously derived polynomials and add them together. You can take uh <coughs> you can take a polynomial f that's already you've already derived that it's zero, and you can multiply it by another polynomial g, and you're trying to derive one equals zero. Okay, and the degree now you're allowed to simplify it every round, so so terms can cancel now that possibly couldn't cancel if you had the flat proof, the null stones, that style proof. And you take multilinearization at every step? Yeah, you take multilinearization at every step. And a good example to see where the difference is between the two is if you look at, um, now I have an eraser, not oh, here it is. <laughs> <coughs> so a good example to see the difference is you have like, like induction corresponds to saying that x1 is 1, um, <coughs> x1, I think it's x1 minus x1, x2 <coughs> equals 0. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> so this is like saying x1 is 1, x1 implies x2, x2 implies x3, dot, 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 but xn is zero, okay? And if you were to prove this with a null Stolensatz proof, the best you can do is log n, and that's by, <coughs> it's easy to see n, you just work your way this way and derive, if x1 is one and x1 implies x2, then these you can derive <coughs> that x2 is one, and then this with this can derive x3 is one, and so on, and that, that proof is a degree n proof, null Stolensatz. But in polynomial calculus, if you measure deg the degree dynamically, uh, you derive this and the high degree terms cancel, you're back down to degree one. So this was a degree two proof. You have to multiply this by x2, and I forget exactly how to do it, it's easy. <laughs> um, but you get x2 equals one with a degree two proof, and then, you're, and then you do these two, and you get you know, x3 equals one, and you keep going in that way. So the whole proof ends up being degree two instead of degree n. So that's an example where you can see that the high degree, the high degree terms can cancel in a PC proof, whereas if you were to write it out as a flat proof without, without kind of pay paying attention to that cancellation, you'd get higher degree. Lower right, the lower bound is logarithmic. I just was showing you the simplest example here. Uh, so this particular null Stolensatz proof is linear, but the, in the corresponding PC measure is, is constant. And it turns out that the right answer for null Stolensatz is logarithmic. So PC can do it in constant by this proof. Null Stolensatz can do it in degree log n. Okay. <coughs> so again, the d only difference between these proof systems is how you measure degree. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Okay. Well, 
because we can prove lower bounds for it. <laughs> um, there's other reasons to, to be interested in it, but uh, it's like the weakest <laughs> measure that, that there is. So if you're going to prove strong, if you're going to prove size bounds, you, you better at least be able to prove. I'm saying the same thing. I was trying to trick you, I guess. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I'm not sure it's a different reason, but yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> You can't always do that, though. Yeah. So, he's, so you're saying sometimes degree is measured. I, sometimes degree corresponds to monomial size. Is that what you're? Monomials. Yeah. Yeah. I actually view monomial measure as also quite weak. But yes, you're right. <laughs> okay. So those are the two algebraic proof systems that I'll start with. And uh, a much stronger one is now, I, I guess it's called Hilbert system now. Um, I defined it a long time ago, and I don't even know if I gave it a name. I think I just called it the algebraic proof system. But it's just really natural. It's just, um, you know, it's the same thing, but you've used si algebraic size as the measure instead of degree. So, you know, you have this proof system that I just defined in the previous slide where the input is P1 through Pm. And what are you allowed to do? You're allowed to add two together. You're allowed to multiply one by another thing and so on. And so you just get it, if you view it, it, it holistically, you get a circuit, an algebraic circuit. And it's computing some polynomial that's supposed to be identically one. Okay, and so the natural measure from my point of view is just the size of that algebraic circuit. Okay? And is that the step you write the mistress or what? No, no, it's just one circuit where the input is the P's and it's a, yeah, it's a, it, and you have addition gates which allow you to um, add previously derived F and G and you have multiplication gates that allow you to multiply F by something. It makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's the same rules that I had before. I'm just measuring. Uh, I'm just like I said, viewing the whole proof holistically is like one big, one big algebraic straight line program. One, be one big algebraic circuit. No, but in the multiplication, you're allowed to multiply by xi. Yeah, in the multiplication case, you can multiply by anything, yeah. in particular so xi and, and one minus xi. Right? xi. Yeah, the variables are xi and one minus xi. You, you can multiply by anything. Once you know that something is zero, you can multiply it by anything. But yeah, but if you're measuring circuit size, you're right. And th there, you, there you have to measure, you have to have a circuit. You have to, if you want to multiply by a circuit, you're going to be charged the size of that circuit. So you're basically divorcing hmm. the idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's so just... The the <laughs> the they're, not the they're not inputs to the circuit in the conventional sense. It's just you're working the idea when you're measuring the circuit size. So you're iteratively going on. In case some small circuits, you might as well just not play the inequality. That's right. You might as well just assume what you said before, that you can multiply by a variable or one minus a variable, and just that. No, it's, uh, okay, so there's a subtlety here. You have an algebraic circuit, and <coughs> it's supposed to be computing the polynomial 1, okay, but you have to, how do you verify that? Um, that's the polynomial identity testing problem. Well, it depends. It depends which field you're under. Um. Right, but you still have to verify that it's computing the polynomial 1, and you don't want to, I mean, one way to do it is just to, to you know, to, to, to write it all out. <coughs> no, it, no, here, <laughs> you want me to show the previous slide? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't. 
you, you don't you don't you don't multilinearize it every step when you view it you, when you view size as circuit size. Okay, I mean you have to pay for that. So all you're allowed to do are these things, and you start with the x i squared minus x i's. Um, <coughs> Right. Not necessarily the square root of your constructed exponent. That's right. Okay. But when I want to charge, uh, when I want to measure size, algebraic circuit size, I want. Well, on the other one, you're going to charge the size of the circuit that you're multiplying. That's right. But the point is that this is, it seems to me, that the fact that the same size as the, that it counts summing the total size of circuits of each line. Is that correct? It's, you know, it's shorter than that because I'm not. Uh, <coughs> No, I, I don't understand what you're saying. I mean, <coughs> if if I derived f and, and it's this circuit here, and I derived g and, and it's this circuit here, then may, maybe they even intersect. Um, I, it's it's just one more gate to derive f plus g. Okay, so building a circuit. I'm, I'm building like a straight line program. You should think of it that way, maybe. I didn't think this slide would be so controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Pavel, maybe, you, is it clear now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so it, it's not clear that uh, this is stronger than polynomial calculus or something? No, it, 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 well, it should be clear that, it's, that it can simulate polynomial calculus. Oh, 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 because it's dynamic, you mean? And the other one is? Because of the multilinearization? I mean, uh, no, the multilinearization, I guess, you would just throw in f n squared minus f n yeah. squared. Yeah, so you can always y you can always multilinearize a, a line, just just what you said. Um, so I guess that's how you would show that you can simulate polynomial calculus with with this stronger size measure. Yeah. <coughs> um, so it sits. Uh, it actually sits pretty high. It can sim. It also can simulate extended Frege, and you can have versions of it where you restrict the circuit size. You know, you could restrict the depth of it. You could restrict it to be a formula. The algebraic straight line program, you can restrict it. Okay. Well, but you know, in circuit complexity, you look at circuits that you do polynomial degrees or polynomial in the number of values. You want to add them with some else? Yes. Yeah, I think. Uh, pa Pavel, can you restrict the. D can you assume that a proof. I don't, I don't remember this. Can you re assume that a proof has restricted. That a proof of polynomial size has polynomial degree no. in Hilbert's system. Yeah. Or one of you guys might know. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah. So formula you can, but not for circuit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> He's. Um, Pavel's going to talk a lot more about about these proof systems. This is just a. A taste. <coughs> uh, I don't even know if I should. I think I might skip this. Y you're going to talk a little bit about this other view. Y yeah, yeah I'm going to skip this so we have a little more time. Okay, you don't have to commit to it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll I'll take one minute to describe. No, Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to prove lower bounds on the, the methods that we have for proving lower bounds for the polynomial calculus. Um, there's a line of work that was done like in the late 90s and er early 2000. Um, <coughs> and I'll, I'll tell you about um, what, what I consider to be maybe one of the easiest methods of, of doing it. Um, basically, if you want to prove lower bounds for degree in the polynomial calculus, you have to have some way to understand uh, you know what what you can derive from the, you, you have to have, have some of understanding the ideal that's generated up to degree d from the starting equations so the, the, you know basically you want to sort of understand the grubner basis the, the stuff that you can generate up to degree d in the grubner basis and this can be really hard or really easy so rasbroff proved the lower bound for the pigeonhole principle by more or less you know a, a very clever way of understanding what the grubner basis truncated to degree d looks like. It's, it's, it's a not an easy proof at all. Um, it's the only linear, it's the only way we know how to prove lower bounds for the pigeonhole principle. 
it's easier to prove lower bounds in, in for null stones that's than it is for polynomial calculus. But for certain <coughs> other uh, tautologies, these Sighton ones or random CNFs, it's actually much easier to prove polynomial calculus lower bounds. And that's because the, you can, uh, well, because the, it's easier to describe the, the, the basis. Okay. So and then Gregoria <coughs> uh, <coughs> built on this linear lower bound to prove lower bounds for semi algebraic proofs. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. So I'm going to tell you about this lower bound a little bit about this lower bound, this polynomial calculus lower bounds for the Sighton formulas, okay? <coughs> okay, so that we're going to prove it for uh, the Sighton contradictions. These are uh, common, popular um, CNF, un unsatisfiable CNF family of formulas in proof complexity. And all they are is mod random mod two equations subject to the constraint that every variable occurs in exactly two equations, okay? That's all they are, okay? And the reason we like them is because you can view them as a graph. <coughs> uh, so you can view. <coughs> so you can view them as you you have a graph that's like th three regular. Say, I might not be very good at make it, making it three regular, but let's say it's three regular. Okay, and each node of the graph corresponds to an equation. Okay, and the edges correspond to variables. Okay, so if this is variable x, y, z then the equation corresponding, <coughs> and I'm going to assume the simplest case of these formulas is where the number of vertices is odd, okay? <coughs> and then in that case, the, I, this equation corresponding to this node just says that this mod 2 sum of these variables is odd, okay? And you have one of those for every node, okay? And since there's an odd number of equations and each one is saying, that it's odd, and since each variable occurs exactly twice, it's unsatisfiable. Okay. Um, a slightly more general, wh what Sighton is more generally, is you can associate a charge with each, th with each of the vertices such that the sum of the charges is odd. Okay, and then the graph doesn't have to be odd, but it's th they're, they're, they're in essence they're the same things. Okay. <coughs> okay, so that's the th those are the the unsatisfiable formulas that we're working with. And again, the variables are, <coughs> if this is vertex V and this is vertex W, then the variables are just the edges in the graph, E, e V, W, okay? <coughs> and the constraints are what I just said, okay? Good. <coughs> so the reason I'm showing you this example is because you can prove lower bounds, polynomial calculus degree lower bounds, using the same expansion width method that I already showed you, okay? <coughs> so you, you can show, because these are very special uh, unsatisfiable formulas, you can actually show that, that they're of a special form. They're, they're sums that they start off being, being sums of binomial, sums of two terms, so they're binomial equations. And because they're, bi a after we convert to one minus one, so we're going to do a linear change of, a linear shift, so they're now over one minus one, and then all the equations are just sums of binomials. And because of that, we're going to be able to see that every line that you derive uh, in the proof is basically a linear combination of those same th objects, sums of binomials. Okay? And because of that, the proof is actually more or less like a resolution proof. Okay? Um, <coughs> so at the high level, we're going to be able to show that because these formulas, because the starting equations are special, we can reduce to resolution with lower bounds. Okay? And we're going to show with lower bounds for, um, for these formulas. Um, <coughs> and then and, and with lower bounds for these formulas is equal to polynomial calculus degree. And like I said before, the key insight, the why this is so easy, is that we're going to switch over to the 1 minus 1. Uh, we're going to you know, do this linear shift to 1 minus 1. And when we do that, all of the initial constraints are sums of sums of monomials, sums of two monomials, okay, so. This is the all in all the proofs. Yeah, it might not look, this might they might not have looked this way, but in all the proofs, this is, this is. Not all the proofs re directly reduce the resolution. You don't have to do that. Um, <coughs> but all the proofs uh, make use of the fact that you're starting with something that's the sum of two monomials. And because of that, 
every line is also going to be the, a linear combination of, of binomials. And because of that, the proofs have a, you know, are much easier to understand. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to a simpler type of a proof that's called a Gaussian proof. And it's just the most obvious thing that you would do to prove. You have a linear system, um, you have a bunch of mod 2 equations, okay? What's the obvious way that you would prove this? You start with this equation that says the mod 2 sum of these is odd, okay? And then you say, take this e constraint next, which says that the mod 2 sum of those edges is odd. And you want to add those two equations together, mod 2, to say that the mod 2 sum of all the of all the vertices hitting these two nodes is even, okay. And now the ones between these two cancel, and so what you're left with is an equation that says that the sum of the edges coming out of these two vertices is even, okay. And you keep doing this. You keep sucking up another node, um, <coughs> and you're constantly deriving for a subset of the constraints that the mod two sum of the edges coming out of those constraints is even or odd, depending on whether the number of nodes in the set is even or odd, okay? And that's called a Gaussian proof. <laughs> Gaussian proof is just, uh, you know, you ha start off with a bunch of mod 2 equations. You're allowed to, to take two and add them together, mod 2, and you're trying to derive one, okay? So that's called a Gaussian, Gaussian proof. And the width of a Gaussian proof is just the maximum width of any linear equation in the proof, okay? Um, and, and using the exact same argument I showed you before, you can show that for a Gaussian proof that the width is high, as long as this graph is an expander graph. So if you start with a three regular graph that's a high, high big expander, you know, at some point, in, at some point you're going to have to pass through, uh, you, you know, at some point you're going to have to derive a line that was derived from, you know, roughly half of the initial equations. So you're going to have to derive a line that was derived from you know, some subset of, say, half of the nodes, and that line, you know, <coughs> all of the, all the variables that are in exactly one, uh, you know, all the boundary, the, the variables that, that go from there out, they all occur exactly once, so they all, are, they're all still going to be in there, okay? So expansion of this graph tells you that there has to be, that any Gaussian proof has to be wide. Does that make sense? Same, same thing we did before. <coughs> So Gaussian width has to be big. What does this have to do with polynomial calculus? Um, <coughs> well, this is just an, as an aside <laughs> that we don't really need. So it, you can prove that Gaussian, that a Gaussian refutation of width w uh, implies a resolution refutation of these things of width w or 2w, I forget. And I think it's the same w and vice versa. So Gaussian width is actually equivalent to resolution width for these, for these tautologies. Okay, so so that's an aside. We don't need that. Okay, so does that make sense? So so far, I've told you that if if the proof was of the simple type, this ga a Gaussian proof, then it's easy to see that it's wide. Now I want to show you that if you have a polynomial calculus proof of these things under this variable shift, that it actually has to be a Gaussian proof, and where width of the Gaussian proof is going to correspond to degree of the polynomial calculus proof. Okay. <coughs> So sorry, this is, this is just, I'm going to ignore this. This is the upper bound that I alluded to before. Where I said the obvious, you know, the only way to prove these uh, with a Gaussian proof is to start with an equation, add, add another equation, to, you know, some order in which you add the equations together. Okay, and as long as the graph is expanding, you have to have a, a wide clause in it. So that was what that slide is. <coughs> and that's the width bound. I'm not going to do it. We already kind of saw it. So the last thing is to show you why... Um <coughs> why uh, a PC proof has to more or less be a, a Gaussian proof, okay? And I'm not going to prove this. I'm just going to show you at a high level and uh <coughs> hope that I can convince you at some level. Um, so like I said before, it's really important that we're going to do this linear change. So we're going to convert the variable xi. xi is, you know, evw. So each variable evw is going to uh, convert <coughs> to 1 minus... Um, Yeah, 1 minus yi divided by 2. <coughs> so the sum of these things equal to b, mod 2, is going to convert to uh, the product of the yi's is equal to 
to B prime, where B prime, you know, is one or minus one, depending on whether B was zero or one. Okay, so y you guys n know this usual shift to the to the Fourier basis, and then x i squared equals x i that converts to y i squared equals one. Okay, so you can sort of see what happens when you do this conversion. Now these are one minus one valued, and the initial equations are just saying that the product of those variables is minus minus one. Okay, for each of these for each of these constraints. That's what the initial things look like, okay? So it's, you know, it's some monomial um, <coughs> equals minus one. That's what they look like, okay? And what can you do? <coughs> um, so I, I could rewrite this. So, so th this is m plus one equals zero. So I can actually re rewrite this in a number of ways. I can break up this m into <coughs> into two pieces m1 and m2 so i could rewrite this as like m1 equals minus m2 or m1 and m2 uh, together gives you m okay so that's why we really should think of this instead of a monomial equals uh, equals a constant you want to think of it more more generally as a sum of two monomials equals zero yeah okay No, no, I'm <coughs> I'm actually taking my PC proof, but I'm I'm not I'm I'm not formalizing it over zero one. I'm formalizing it from the start over minus one one, and it's going to preserve degree because it's a linear conversion. So I, I, if I t start with a PC proof over the usual zero one, I'm going to I'm I'm not going to do that. I'm basically going to take a PC proof over one minus one, but because you go from one to the other with this linear shift the degree will be preserved. Now the basis in the zero one case is super ugly and the basis in this case is going to be really nice so that's why we're doing this. Mm. Oh, did I misunderstand you? Oh right, so what I'm trying to show you is that Oh, it should be the other way around. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm on my own tangent here. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it should be converting PC proofs to Gaussian proofs. Yeah. Um. Right, so the main lemma <coughs> is that if you start with a with W Gaussian proof, um, <coughs> it implies, oh, uh, you're right, this goes in the wrong direction too. Um. Well, this lemma is true, but, <laughs> but I really want the other direction. So this lemma states that if you have a with, this is easy to see, that a with W Gaussian proof converts to a PC proof where all lines are binomials. Okay. And in fact, they're all going to look like one monomial equals, equals a constant, okay? <coughs> but the other direction, um, the other direction is the harder direction, that, and it's not really that hard, is that a PC refutation of Cyton of degree D actually implies a Gaussian proof of width at most 2D, okay? And <coughs> again, I'm not going to prove this, but it's not a hard proof, and it's just you formally you prove it by induction on the number of lines, but the key insight is that because you're starting with things that are the sum of binomials, uh, the sum of monomials, binomials, that every line in the proof you can prove inductively is still basically a linear combination of binomials. Okay. Binomials. Of binomials. Yeah, the only reason for linear combination is because you have a rule that says you can take the sum of two things. But if you didn't take the sum and you kept them all separate, it, they would just be all binomials. Yeah, yeah, it's like M1 minus, pardon me, it's just, uh, <coughs> so it's just the sum of these things, but they're special binomials. I mean, you might think, okay, okay, I see what I, I see what, what you're confused about. So I, <coughs> so these are, of s th these are of a special type. So these are like, th these monomials of this type correspond to Gaussian, Gaussian lines that you can derive. I should have made this more formal on the slide, but I was just trying to get to the idea. So I want to show that, that each... This is different from an arbitrary... It's not like I can just break the proof up into binomials, because I'm breaking it up into things that look like M1 minus M2 equals B, uh, M1 prime minus M2 prime equals B prime, and so on. So I can actually break it up into... Uh, you can think of the PC proof as being broken up into distinct statements that are of this binomial form. And those are just Gaussian equations. So something of, of this form 
I can rewrite it uh, as, you know, as a Gaussian line. That the sum of these, the sum of all the stuff in here is equal to whatever the, whatever the charge ends up being. Does that make sense? So I'm working, <coughs> um, so I don't understand the question, say so it again. Whenever, whenever I write a polynomial which is a sum of binomials of this sort, I always maintain the invariant that if I added the coefficients. Well, except that I'm allowed to take linear combinations, and so that's why you're not going to have, but you're right. You, you're right. He, here I'm assuming that the, that, the, that the constants here are, yeah, that, that, that it's just one or zero. Is that, was that your question? And, and these are, oh yeah, I didn't, s n yes, that's true too. These are undisjoint variables. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thanks. So this takes, a, this takes an argument, but it's, n it's not, um, it's, it's, it's not complicated. Yeah. <coughs> so more or less the, the polynomial calculus degree lower bound boils down to the simple width argument. Okay. <coughs> How much time do I have? Oh, uh, okay. So, okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about semi-algebraic proof systems. So the difference between semi-algebraic and algebraic is here you you are allowed to have lines that don't just say that a, a polynomial equals zero, but you can have lines that say a polynomial equals zero or a polynomial is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay. So again, you're working on over some field and in, in the proof complexity case you tend to think of the field as being finite uh, you have again variables x1 through xn usually boolean valued okay forget the finite field yeah that, that makes it more complicated for me yep okay, okay fine you're over the reals <laughs> <laughs> um, so you start with two kinds of equations you start with the equalities and you start with the inequalities, and you're trying to, again, show that there's no solution, okay? <coughs> and you have the inequalities now that the variables are between 0 and 1, okay? And uh, there's a lot of semi-algebraic proof systems out there. Cutting planes is one. Um, these are all almost the same. Sum of squares, Lasserre, positive sum and stuff. There are different names for a proof system that's... Th almost this there's l small differences between these but they're more or less the same proof system and then you have a dynamic version of this the dynamic version is sort of like the analog of polynomial calculus and this is more the analog of null stalin sets so you should think of this system as the analog of null stalin sets where you have inequalities okay and this one is the analog with inequalities but where you do it you're allowed to do it line by line to measure degree okay and these systems Shirley Adams Lova, Shriver, and so on. These are all weaker than both of these. Uh, I'll skip cutting planes. Uh, because of the greater than or equal. Oh, you mean it, why is it related to semi-algebraic sets? Is that, why you're, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm, I, uh, somebody else is in a better position to answer that than me. <laughs> Okay, so let me just define the SOS proof system for you. I'm going to start with the dynamic version of it because it's easier. And then the static version of it is, again, just where you, you're not allowed to do any cancellations. Okay, so you start with a set of polynomial equalities as well as inequalities. If we're using an SOS proof system to prove that something's unsatisfiable, <laughs> you don't have any inequalities. You just have the, the F1 through FM. Okay, but you can still... This proof system still can give you more power over polynomial calculus, okay? And a refutation, um, you're, you're, it, again, it's a rule-based proof system where you're allowed to take... <coughs> um, so I thought I had a better slide than that. I think I deleted the wrong one. Drats. Oh, well, okay. So <coughs> you're allowed to... <coughs> So you're allowed to derive, you have the old rules that you had before for the f's, okay? So you're allowed to take two and add them together, take one and multiply it by, by an arbitrary other polynomial, okay, for the f's. But for the h's, you're allowed to, um, you have to, uh, you're, you're still allowed to add two together. If you know that two polynomials are bigger than or equal to zero, you can add them together. But now you can't multiply by an arbitrary polynomial, just another one that you already know is bigger than or equal to zero, 
Okay, and the other thing you can do is you can, this is the sum of squares part, you can take an arbitrary polynomial and you can square it, okay, and you can use that, okay, and you can use that, you know, in, in, this, in this way. Okay, so again, you're allowed to take any f and multiply it by an, another previously derived polynomial, uh, by anything, you can take any two things that were previously derived and add them together, um, <coughs> and for the, and you can take a, any polynomial and square it, that's a legal legal move, and, and, and that's it. Okay, so does that make sense? You're trying to refute the fact that there's a solution to these initial set of equations, okay? And included in these is the fact that, in the Boolean case, the fact that the variables are between 0 and 1, included in here. Yes, sorry, you're trying to derive <laughs> minus 1 is bigger than equal to 0. Right, and the measure is the degree. So for dynamic SOS, you measure the degree at every step, and for the usual static one, you it's a one-shot thing. Okay. Um, yeah, no, you have to have, it has to be like over the reels, I think. I guess so, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <coughs> okay, for for lower bounds, we have lower bounds for, f more or less for all of them, where the degree is the measure. What's the difference between So the difference is how you measure degree. So in the same, it's, uh, it's analogous to the difference between PC, polynomial calculus, and null Stalin sets. So for SOS plus, or star, you, every time you, you do an operation, like it adding to multiplying, you, you, you calculate the degree, and it's the minimum no, but the degree can be lower because you can have cancellations. Yeah, you don't accumulate the degree. Yeah. Exactly. It's exactly the same as, yeah. It, no, but it is exactly the same. If you were to homogenize everything in the polynomial calculus, you get exactly homogenized PC is not null Stalin sets, and likewise. For Okay, so I don't have time to tell you about SOS lower bounds, but there's a really, uh, the argument that I sort of gave you for polynomial calculus, it generalizes fairly straightforwardly to give lower bounds for Cyton for the dynamic version of SOS, so for SOS and SOS plus. And it's this more or less the same proof that Grand Schoenebeck uh, sort of uh, reinvented um, that you might be more familiar with. <coughs> Um, no, you mean the, the, the equality ones or the greater than or equal? Not the greater than or equal to one. Not the semi-algebraic. Oh, I might have made a mistake. You're, you yeah, it, yeah, th sorry, this should not be here. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, this is over GF2 and that's over the real, so I don't even know. Yeah, that, that shouldn't be there. Sorry. I'm running out of time, so I think I'm. <laughs> no, 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 I'm yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, are you trying to figure out how the semi algebraic ones fit in with these? Okay, so. <coughs> okay. Okay, so <coughs> so we do not have any any lower bounds above above the red line. Th polynomial calculus was was sort of a, a weakening of of the Hilbert system, the IPS system, to more or less like a really simple case where we could can prove lower bounds, and that's a very sub, and that is a, a sub. That's a special type of AC zero P Frege proofs. How is your reasoning? Yeah, because you can think of the lines as just being, uh, if you're over GF two, the lines are like mod two of of ands. Okay, as opposed to like a, a general circuit. Okay, so this is a very restricted type of AC zero Frege proof. If we're over, say, GF P and both. Yeah, so we have good formulas here. So, for example, the Cyton formula, 
uh, th this one, we think that it should be hard for AC0, anything not, not 2, AC0, 3, 5, whatever. So as long as you can count mod 2, you can do it. And if you can't, then you can't do it. In the lower bounds that I gave you here, I didn't, I should have said this, but we're w we were working in a field that wasn't, you know, we were working in something other than characteristic 2 to get those lower bounds. I should have said that. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Random sat is a is a good candidate. Well, it, it it's a. It's a I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Let me just. I I think I'm completely running out of time, so I, I'm going to skip this. There's another way to get SOS lower bounds that I wanted to get to, but we're out of time, so I'll skip it. But it's you can actually get very strong lower bounds for SOS using communication complexity. Um, I'll skip that though. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to tell you about some implications or connections between this and, uh, and negative <coughs> results on families of algorithms. So I just, three that s you may or may not know about these, but I think they're really interesting and important. Um, so if you, we, we sort of alluded to this before, if you prove a lower bound for a proof system, you're ruling out a family of algorithms for solving SAT, okay? And the question is, wha are they natural family of algorithms? Do they say anything about algorithms that people care about? And they actually do, and they actually rule out algorithms that people do care and study a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to just briefly tell you about three. So the first one is, uh, <coughs> so the most natural algorithms for SAT are DPLL-based algorithms. So they're variants on making a decision tree, but instead of just making the tree, you, you make the tree in a very special way where you you, it's called with memoization. So you do backtracking, you do very clever things um, when you're exploring the DPLL tree. Okay? And <coughs> you know, we know that if you run one of these things on an unsatisfiable formula like the pigeonhole principle, since all of these backtracking trees are resolution proofs, you get exponential lower bounds from the resolution exponential lower bounds. But what, what's not obvious is, well, what if you're running a SAT algorithm on a satisfiable instance? Like you'd like to still prove that it's that if you're running a DPLL style algorithm on a satisfiable formula, you'd still be able to you would like to understand still when and why the algorithm is going to take a long time to find a satisfying assignment. And uh, in a picture, there was a very nice paper um, by Malloy and uh, Dimitri. Ar 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 Thank you. <laughs> Um, and Paul Beam, and they studied p certain DPLL natural heuristics for solving random SAT uh, using these natural DPLL heuristics. And more or less, what they what they showed was that when you when you apply when you're when you're building a DPLL tree on a on a random formula below the slightly below the threshold, so you know it's satisfiable, okay? And you're trying to find an assignment. You know it's satisfiable with high probability. What's going to happen is that as you set variables. The, the formula is going to shrink, so it's going to have some two clauses in it and some three clauses in it. And what they prove is that with very high probability, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, if you use one of these heuristics, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have to explore an unsatisfiable mixed two-three clause that's going to be hard for resolution, and that's why it's going to take exponential time. Okay, so it's a very, very clever argument twist on the usual situation in proof complexity because you're proving a lower bound on a satisfiable instance. Okay. And that was what this picture was trying to show you. Exploring some art, no matter what the tree is, no matter how you explore it, you're going to run into these mixed <coughs> two, three unsatisfiable subclauses, uh, subformulas, even though the original thing is satisfiable. And they're going to, the big blue means it's going to take you a long time no matter, no matter what you do because y you're, you're using a resolution lower bound which is going to apply to any any resolution-based algorithm, including the DPLL ones. Okay. Um, there's also a strong connection between lower bounds uh, for extension complexity and um, sum of squares lower bounds. Um, if you don't know what extension complexity is, I won't. <laughs> I'll, I'll skip it because we don't have time now. But um, there's a long history of lower bounds on the extension complexity. Do I have time to talk about this or? I probably don't, right? Okay, I'll skip it. I'll skip it. I don't. I don't want to to crowd the rest of the day, but I just wanted to say that you know th there's a beautiful results here, um, but one way to prove lower bounds on extension complexity is to reduce them to uh, 
semi-algebraic proof system lower bounds. And the last two papers um, <coughs> did, did this. So they, this paper showed that um, the extension complexity of approximating max cut within 2 minus epsilon requires super polynomial size and the proof reduces to a Shirley Adams lower bound. And similarly, they got the SDP version of it by reducing to an SOS lower bound. It's a really good question. Yeah, I don't understand this paper. I would love to, but I've tried. <laughs> if somebody here understands it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think some of it is the communities were so far apart. So I think some of it was rediscovering the wheel. And for me, some of it's the language that's uh, used. But there are new ideas here that are, you know, completely outside of anything we've done in proof complexity so far. So. Um, and then the last one is integrality gaps for uh, for certain LP, SDP algorithms. There's a very strong connection between, um, I'm going to skip the slides, but there's a very strong connection between <coughs> uh, proving integrality gaps for LP and SDP algorithms for um, NP-hard functions and proving lower bounds for uh, SOS and the corresponding semi-algebraic proof systems. Sorry, this is a lot of slides here. I'm going to just skip over all these. Okay, so I just want to conclude um, with some open problems. So the good news in general with proof complexity is that, you know, we don't have these barriers like natural proofs. Um, uh, and again, we have these very natural applications to concrete uh, algorithmic paradigms. And I think we're really still just trying to figure those out and make those more precise. Um, <coughs> so lots of open problems. Uh, one, a, a couple of old classic ones is uh, hard examples for Frege and extended Frege. You know, everybody just assumes that Frege is not polynomially bounded and Frege is weaker than extended Frege and extended Frege is not polynomially bounded. But I think that, that um, this assumption is, is really on shaky grounds relative to our belief that P doesn't equal NP. I mean, we have pretty much no really convincing examples that exponentially separate Frege proofs from extended Frege proofs. And we don't have, in my mind, very convincing examples at all for why extended Frege uh, is, is not polynomially bounded. <coughs> there are some examples, but I, don't, I just don't, uh, it's, it's not convincing <laughs> that they're really hard. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, why, why would I think that they wouldn't? I mean, I, if, if you can, if you know that a formula above the threshold is unsolved, if you can replace the counting argument uh, wi with a constructive argument, then I would think that it should be formalized in extended Frege, because everything can be formalized in extended Frege. Um, so we know that, like, any formula above the threshold is almost certainly unsatisfiable. And, uh, yeah, like counting argument. And I'm saying that if you can replace that argument with something constructive, and, and we do know how to do that if we, uh, if we go a, a more above the threshold. So if we take a formula that's, you know, more above the threshold than right. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't even have to be that big. I forget the argument, but there's an argument that's even, uh, I don't remember the parameters, but you can get the density much closer to the threshold. And there's and there are arguments that I think reduce to. Um, I, I have to think about it. I don't see any reason to think that there aren't upper bounds. Yeah, I mean I'm not saying that there are. I just don't see any reason why people think that random formulas a little bit above the threshold should necessarily be hard to refute. Yeah, I'll stick to my. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's also examples based on hardness of one-way functions. I think they're a little more convincing for me personally. And then there's these canonical examples that, uh, you know, for any two proof systems, if you think that they're far apart, if you think that one can't polynomial simulate another, you can always come up with uh, a, a CNF formula that's sort of complete for that. So you can express the soundness of the stronger proof system and if you can show that that can be proved in the weaker proof system, then the two are polynomial equivalent, and, equivalent, and that's an if and only if. And so those are fairly, if you, know, you want to separate fr Frege from extended Frege, those are as convincing as you could ever get, because <laughs> you have, 
you're going to have to do something with those in order to separate them. Um, but I, I still just feel that we really don't have any good reason one way or the other <laughs> for why we think, except for that we think NP doesn't equal co-NP, but I'm not really even sure, I don't know if I want this on record, but I'm not really even sure why we think that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Um, so I didn't mean to be controversial, but I actually, yeah, that is how I feel. Um, I think there's really, really interesting interconnections between uh, uh, ver these notions, monotone complexity in various <laughs> models, um, monotone circuit complexity, monotone formula size complexity. There's, uh, <coughs> you know, there's notions of monotone span programs, and they're closely, those concepts are closely connected to notions of rank, which is closely connected to SOF, proof complexity, which is more or less equivalent to a certain notion of rank, which is non-negative rank, which is connected to communication complexity. Uh, so these are all extremely interrelated to one another. And I'd like to sort of understand, uh, be nice if somebody understood. I know people have been trying, but I feel like there's more to be done there. Um, <coughs> you'll hear more about the, you know, the connections between these Hilbert-style proof systems and um, you know, the, 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 the topic of this meeting. Um, so we know that these Hilbert style systems, if you can prove lower bounds for them, then that uh, implies major consequences for algebraic circuit complexity. It impri implies the permanent and the determinant. You know, there's a separation between them. And uh, there's already been two really nice papers exploring this connection. I think there's probably a lot more that can be done. And uh, I personally would love to understand the proof complexity of polynomial identity testing. Um, so, you know, we, we don't know if you can, uh, we, we think, but we don't know whether, you can, whether, there's a, whether there's a polynomial time uniform algorithm for polynomial identity testing. But we do have non-uniform algorithms for polynomial identity testing. And uh, uh, one question I would like to know is whether, whether any algorithm, non-uniform or not, that's polynomial time, whether its correctness proof can be carried out in, in Hilbert's system or in extended Frege. Um, to me, this is or extended Frege. To me, this is a really central question. Um, <coughs> this is what about some of the SVP constructions or uh, speed constructions? We, we have uniform right. Uniform right. I, I, I don't know. I think that's. Uh, I don't know if any of you have. Just like linear algebra. I, guess. I would think. Yeah, I would think that the ones we have sh sh could be formalized. But you, you're the, you guys are the experts in this. So. Yeah, for non-commutative, it's in this paper. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I think there's all sorts of really cool cool things to... Um, the, the proof complexity of PIT is uh, um, it, it's interesting in its own right, but I also think that it's interesting because it turns out that uh, um, it's centrally connected to whether the Hilbert cell system is the same in power to extended Frege. <laughs> so if, if you can prove the PIT the axioms, there's natural axioms for PIT. Um, <coughs> and if you can prove them uh, with, with polynomial size extended Frege proofs, then these Hilbert systems are equivalent in strength to extended Frege. Um, so that's, you know, to me that's a really interesting and probably deep question. Um, and then to answer your question that you asked before about hard examples, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I should I'll go all the way back. But anyways, the only examples that we have for Hilbert or for extended Frege for the really strong ones are the ones we mentioned before. Unsatisfiable, random instances, uh, things related to uh, one-way functions, and, um, and then soundness types of statements. Um, for sep They're all conjectured to be hard, um, and, and, and those are the only ones that I know of that we have. Uh, for separating Frege from extended Frege, there we have a lot more examples. Um, <coughs> we have uh, you know, lots of examples coming from linear algebra where we think that uh, extended Frege proofs are polynomial size and extended Frege proofs should require quasi-polynomial size um, because the proofs of these statements involve determinant calculations, which is doable, uh, which seems to require quasi-polynomial size formulas but has polynomial size circuits. So there we have some, uh, in my mind, more convincing examples. And that's, that's it. Thank you very much.